like three times the number of people that were up here or that are out here than I were here when I first got up here this morning. So Warner's on uh, on uh, vacation. So please be praying for his vacation. For those of you who weren't here, Elise, thank you for leading worship. I don't know where you went, but thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, Welcome to 2022. I think we're all hopeful. <laughs> uh, I'm Jonathan. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, great seeing you guys. Uh, I hope that it, it, it feels like it's been forever, <laughs> right? Like we, we take one Sunday off, and it's like, I don't know what to do with myself. In fact, yesterday, my parents were out until this morning, and uh, on Saturday morning, I, I, uh, we were hanging out, and I went, it's not Sunday today, is it? <laughs> like, that would be really bad. I probably would have gotten a phone call at that point. But, uh, but anyway, I hope you guys are getting your schedules back uh, together. And uh, we are kicking off a, a series for the next eight weeks titled Life on Mission. And so I, what I want to do is I want us to review kind of where we've been, um, what, we, what we talked through in 2021, um, because it set the stage and laid the foundation for where we're going this year and what we're going to be talking about and what we're kind of kind of rallying the troops, if you will. And, and, and the question that I want you all to be thinking about as we're going through this is, is why? Why are we here? What's our purpose? I mean, if, if, there's, if there's a lofty question, it is, why do we exist, right? What's the meaning of life? It's this proverbial question um, and, it's, and it's sad, though, that it, it, it sits as this question, and it's almost uh, a joke, right? That, that people say that as a, some sort of a flippant thing. Oh, you know, what's the meaning of life? And I don't know, what the, you know. That's a really serious question. It's a really serious question. And if we don't have a good understanding of what God intends the meaning of our life to be, we're going to be spinning our wheels, so uh, before we do that, I'm going to pray, but uh, first, the kindergarten through fifth graders are in here uh, this week, so thank you guys and gals. Um, pray for the parents. It's okay. It's okay if your kids speak up. It's, it's totally cool, and, and uh, you know, uh, in the past, I've, I've made some challenges I won't make again, but, um, uh, but uh, it's, it's good having everybody in here, and we do this intentionally. We, we do it partly um, based on availability of volunteers, but honestly, there's a very, there's a very deliberate reason why we bring the, the kids in here, so that they can see their parents worship, that they can see what worship is and what it's like and, and what you all are doing. And so those little eyes that are about three feet tall or so um, are looking, and they're looking around, and they're assessing and trying to see what is this thing that, that my parents do on the other side of this wall? And so that, that, it's intentional. So uh, with that, let me, uh, let me open by praying. Father, we thank you so much for this time. Thank you for giving us instruments and song to worship you. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to be led in worship like that. Um, and God, we, um, for those of us who aren't musically inclined, it's... it's uh, it's a joy to be able to, to do that and to come before you and to worship you. And as we open up your word, we're continuing to worship you. We're going to read from Scripture this morning, Father, and I just ask that you would remove me from the equation, that you would just speak into hearts the way that only you can, and that you would change us, shape us, Open our eyes, help us to see what you want for us, and help us to understand what you've given us. Thank you for your son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to start in John chapter 17, verse 18. If you have Bibles, there's Bibles kind of scattered around. The verse will be on the screen. I'll be reading from the ESV, but... Uh, or you can open up your phones and go to it from there. So we're going to start in John 17, 18, and then we're going to, we're going to kind of work our way through this. I'm going to kind of build this. And the very first thing that we're going to read is something that should weigh heavy on us when we read it. So here's Jesus. This is often referred to as the high priestly prayer. So this is kind of Jesus' last words. He's praying to the Father. 
and he's praying on behalf of and for the disciples, but also for all of us, uh, those who would hear from them, right? And so this is what he says in verse 18. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So let's just pause there for a second, right? So here's the God of all creation sending Jesus into the world. And and I think all of us can go, oh, well, I know why Jesus came into the world. He came to save us, and that's great. So then what then does it mean by, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world? He's talking about the disciples. He's talking about us. Like, he has sent us into the world. Do you feel sent into the world? Because I do not. I feel like I'm in the world, I live here, but I don't wake up every morning feeling like I'm sent. And when we use these words, life on mission, right, we, we think about that, and it's like, yeah, there's a mission, there's an objective, there's something to be done. In my, in my military career, that's all I did, right? I had a mission. What was the mission today? What was the mission tomorrow? What, what was the mission last week, right? It was always about the mission. And there were smaller little missions, but there was one bigger mission right? And, and there's, there's battles and there's campaigns, right? And so, and so the question for us then is, if we are in fact sent, just as Jesus is sent, we need to really understand what the expectation is. What, what does that mean for us? And, and should that affect what I do? I mean, I think all of us in here would go, well, yes, yes, it should. And yes, it, it should affect what you do. And yes, we should be thinking about it often. And I mean, here, here we are in 2022, and, you know, we probably all have a lot of New Year's resolutions and things that we're going to do, <laughs> right? Um, but this isn't something that, that uh, is, is just constrained to here and now. It's not Sunday morning. It's not, this, this is not, being sent into the world is not coming in here. This is part of it. It's not all of it. In fact, it's a very small part of it. And so that's what we're going to dive into. So, but, so what we need to understand then is if, if we are sent into the world as Jesus is sent into the world, how was Jesus sent into the world? Let, let's, let's look at that. So go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Paul says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Sorry, here's verse 6. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And so here's Jesus dwelling eternally with the Father, laid aside his, his status, if you will, in heaven, came being born in the likeness of men. And this, and this Philippians 2 passage is a beautiful passage. If there's ever one that you want to memorize, I think this is a, a great one to do it. And so what he says is, this is who Jesus was. This is how Jesus was sent. Okay, well, that's not how we were sent. <laughs> right? Not at all. None, none of us existed eternally with God in heaven, and we were born here on this earth to, to do something. So the question then for us is, what does he mean by we are sent just as Jesus was sent. You see, it's, it's not a question of how, but a question of why. Why was Jesus sent? And why then are we sent? So turn over, if you would, to John chapter 1, verse 18. And, and in fact, the beginning of John, it, it I had a hard time picking which verse I wanted to, to use as we were going through this. But I think 118 kind of summarizes it the best. He says, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Jesus, who is at the Father's side, has made God the Father known. You see, this is the thing that separates Christianity from every religion. And this is why we would say that Christianity isn't a religion. 
Because a religion is, is humanity trying to figure out who God is and what he wants from, from us. Well, Christianity is, is, is God coming to us, intervening into our world. In fact, this whole, all of scripture is stories of just that, right? In encounters where God has intervened in time with certain people, to communicate certain things, whether that's prophets or stories and, or, you know, Abraham leaving and moving and right, all of these stories of faith and trusting in God, that's what's littered throughout the Old Testament. And then as we get into the New Testament, we see, we see the same thing as Jesus came to reveal who the Father is. What are the characteristics of this God? And we read this, right, when, when Paul goes to Athens, they have, a, they have a statue that's to the unknown God. And he says, I can tell you who that God is. Because the one that you don't know, the one that you haven't just conjured up in your own mind, not the God of the water and the God of the land and the God of the lightning and all these random gods of the harvest and all of these things, it's not, it's not something that you made up. It's something that God revealed to us. And so from a base level understanding, the fact that God would reveal himself to us means something, doesn't it? It means that he wants us to know. And we talked about this a little bit on Eve Eve. He, he wants us to know who he is. So when we talk about Jesus saving us, Right? And we talked about this, this great exchange where Jesus takes our sin and gives us his righteousness, right? Like that's, that's the good news of the gospel. That's what, we, that's what we're here, that's what we're talking about, that's what we want to tell everybody about because, because without that exchange happening, we're all lost. And we have no hope of covering over our sins or being righteous in God's eyes. So there's nothing we can do with the exception of Jesus. And so we go, okay, well, so here's this exchange. That's what Jesus came to do. Kind of, yeah, he did. But he also came to reconcile us to the Father. That's really the problem, right? The problem started in the garden when Adam and Eve rebelled. The problem starts with our rebellion. And so what does God want to do? He wants to reconcile us to him. He wants to take that rebellion as we've ran away. He wants to, us to bring, he wants to bring us back into the fold, right? He goes and searches out for the one lost sheep. He leaves the 99 and goes and gets the one, right? He wants us to know who he is. He wants us to understand what unmerited forgiveness looks like. What, what's grace? He wants us to experience his mercy and love. And so Jesus comes to show those things. And we, and we read through all of the New Testament, we read these stories of Jesus showing the characteristics of God. That's what he's doing, right? He's not going out teaching moral lessons for the sake of morality. He's going out showing like, this is how the Father loves. This is how the Father forgives. This is what the Father does. In fact, if you look at John chapter 5, verse 19, listen to what Jesus says. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. You see, you can't, you can't read scripture and not read the Trinity into this, this, this threefold Godhead, this, that, that Jesus is, is equal to the father and the father to the Holy Spirit. And, and right, they're, they're co-equal. They're three persons one entity, right? One, and so what you see in this is that Jesus goes, I'm doing the same thing that my father's doing. And what my father's doing, I'm doing. One and the same. The son can do nothing of his own accord. They, they are paired. They are together. So Jesus walking around on terra firma, on the earth, right? He became incarnate to show us how God would interact in these circumstances. He, would, he came to show us what does real love look like? What does real forgiveness look like? 
This is why Jesus came, not, not just to rescue us. I mean, this is all wrapped up together. It's all part of the same rescue, right? Because the problem with our rescue is that we need to be reconciled. The problem with our reconciliation is that we don't even know who this God is other than what he's revealed to us. And so what we look at from this is we go, this is a beautiful thing to see who God is in Jesus. And this is why Jesus was sent, to reveal the Father. And in fact, we even look at John 17, verse 8. It's not just the actions that Jesus does. Verse 8, he says, For I have given them the words that you gave me. The very words from the mouth of the Father, Jesus gave to us, spoke to us. And they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. So it's not just the actions that Jesus did, but it's his very words. This is why we call this scripture. This is why we call this the word of God. And we could go vastly, deeply into what does it mean by the word. And the, the, the actual Greek word there is logos. And it's, and it's a bigger a bigger idea than just the actual word that you write, letters that make up a word. It's more than that. And so what he's saying here is that, that the words of God are Jesus. The word became flesh. We've all heard this, right? That's what he's talking about. The very words that Jesus spoke, the things that he did, all were for one purpose, to reveal God, to reconcile us to him so that we would be rescued. That's it. So let's back up then. What are we to do? What did it say in John 1.18 that Jesus was doing? To make him known. And so what do we have? We're to make him known. We're to reveal the Father to the world. That's, that's our calling. It's, it's, not, it's not how we do it, right? It's why. What's our purpose in life? That's our purpose in life. It's not, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about our creator. And our life, your life, whatever it looks like, wherever you're at, is about that making God known to this world. And, and the world needs to know him, don't they? They need to know what his grace looks like. They need to know what real forgiveness is. They need to know what love is, unconditional love. They need to know what it looks like to be forgiven over and over and over again. They need to understand what it looks like to suffer and to go through life, but to still maintain hope. They need to see what it looks like to go through tragedy and still be able to celebrate and worship God. That's what they need to see. And that's all based on who God is, that, that he is a sovereign God. And we need to know. And this, isn't just, this isn't just outside of this building, right? I need you all reminding me of who God is, right? Right? We all need this. We need this encouragement within the body of believers to make him known, to remind us, don't, don't forget, God's got this. It's okay. What's he doing in your life? What's he working in this? How is, how is he being glorified? How are you being profited by this? Not profited money-wise, right? But profited like changed, our good, his glory. That's, that's the end state, right? That's what, that's what he's doing in our lives. And so we've been sent. We've been sent to make God known to this world. Does that weigh on you? Does it weighs on me? Does I go, that is not what I'm thinking about. It's just not. I mean, and I even get the opportunity to stand up here and preach and go, well, there, check. I at least, I, I preach the word, and yet I still feel the same way you guys do. 
where I go, my, my life isn't about that. Like you can, you can do whatever, you can shape whatever you want in your life, but ultimately, is it about making God known to the world? Because that's what he's called us to. When I was a kid, my, um, I, was probably, I was probably 14 years old, um, and my dad had a, uh, he had built like a, we had like an embankment in the back of our yard. And he had built a deck up there and, and, um, and we had like a dining room, like a table up there, a patio table. And we, it was in San Diego, so it was always good weather. So we'd almost always eat up there. The problem was, is it was like 20 steps and it was, it was, it was a hike to get to the deck. Like you had to walk up the steps. And so it was always like, hey, you carry this, you carry this, you carry this. And we'd all walk up there and we'd sit down. And inevitably we would forget something. Um, of course, being the youngest, that was always, you know, my task to go get said object, whatever it was, right? And so they sent me down to go get it. And I, honestly, this is probably like the joke that they uh, tease me about to this day, probably more than anything else. And they, they go, hey, Jonathan, we need salt. Can you go get the salt? So they sent me down to, into the house to go get salt. Simple, Right? And I forgot why I was there. <laughs> in, the, in the five minutes it took me to get down to the house, I, and I don't remember what I was thinking. I don't think I thought, I don't know, I'm just going to guess. Because I could have just walked back out and yelled something. And this is probably what makes it even sadder, right? Not that, it's not a sad story, but the correlation is, right? It's because I, I, I could have just poked my head back out and go, <laughs> I totally forgot. What did you need? Salt. Oh, okay. Let me go with salt. I grabbed the knife out of the drawer, <laughs> and I went all the way back up to the deck, and I go, and then I sit down, and my whole family looks at me, and they're like, when we asked for salt, why did you bring us a knife? And I don't know. I have no idea. I don't have a great punchline to this story. I wish I did. But this is how we live. God sends us out and he goes, go make me known. And we're like, here's the knife. <laughs> and he goes, that's not what I sent you for. This is how we live our lives. We, we are going and getting all sorts of things. It's not what he sent us for. And so this, this is what I want us to be thinking about as we go into 22 of what does that look like? And we're going to be stepping through. What does it mean for us to be sent? What does it mean for us to wake up in the morning and, and open up our Bibles and, and pour over Scripture and go, I want to know who you are. Because when I know who you are, then I can go and make you known better. Right? Right? I want to spend time in prayer because what's going to happen is I'm going to have some sort of interaction with somebody today. And my natural tendency is probably to defend myself or to argue my point, you fill in the blank, to be impatient, to get angry, you know, whatever that is, right? And what am I doing? I'm not making God known at that point. I'm making Jonathan known at that point. But if I can just respond the way that I can go, hey, in this circumstance, how do I best make God know? <laughs> that would change everything. Not, and not about us. We're, we're saved. We're children of God, right? This isn't a matter of us earning our salvation, being better people. This isn't a morality problem. This is so that those, your neighbors and your coworkers and your family, and I even charge this on Eve, Eve, right? I go, okay, you have a bunch of people in your house, you're going to be around a lot of people you don't really agree with. Use the time to, to speak truth, to preach the gospel. I won't have you guys raise your hands on how you felt like you did, but I'd love to hear the stories. Because the reality is, is that's our calling. That's what we've been, it's not something that, that happens here in Sunday. It's not. So there's two things, two things I want you guys to take with you today. First, you were sent to your world, your world, all of your world, because guess what? I can't go and speak 
to your coworkers, neighbors, or whomever. You can't hire this out. You can't. Making God known is making him known in your life. How has God worked in your life? You've got stories. What the world sees as coincidence or luck, you see it as God's sovereignty, right? What the world sees as chaos and unknowns, you have this confidence and surety. They need to hear that from you, not from some recorded sermon. I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of people out there that speak way better than I do that you could listen to, but that, that's not it. It's not an information problem. If there's one problem our society has now, it is not information or a lack of information. It's not the problem. It's not that they just have never heard of Jesus. I mean, perhaps, maybe. But what does he mean to you? What has he done in your life? How can you make him known in your world? So turn over to Ephesians 5, 24. Four twenty-four. <laughs> yes, those of you who are looking that up, we're like we're switching topics. Ephesians four twenty-four. Paul says, "And to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness." And, and there's there's a lot more that talks about this. This you know, we we all say this, but this new birth right? I was reborn or a born-again Christian. They they don't use that term very often anymore, but right? Like this idea that, that you are a new creation. This is what Paul says in Ephesians. You are a new creation. If you have placed your trust in Jesus Christ, you are a new creation, and you're being made into what? The likeness of God. You're never gonna get there, just so we're clear, okay? What did Jesus come to do? Reveal God. How? By in the way that he was living, how are we to? Righteousness and holiness. How are you doing? Are we ever going to be holy? Are we ever going to be right? No. But this is sanctification. This is what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. Right? Those of us who have placed our trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and starts changing us. He starts setting us apart. That's what holiness is, right? That's what that means, to be set apart, to be sanctified. I don't want to go too much on a tangent. That, that picture of sanctification and holiness is such a beautiful way to understand the gospel. Because what God does is he sanctifies us. That means, that means you go, hey, this piece of paper right here, this is for special purposes. This one, don't care. This is just for ordinary purposes. But this one is holy, it's sanctified, it's for special purposes. That's us. We're, we're for special purposes. What's our special purpose? To make God known. That's what he's talking about when he says that, that it, we're being shaped and our new creation is a likeness of God so that we can grow in our righteousness and holiness so that we can be set apart for his purposes. That's what he's talking about here. So this is the work of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. This isn't something that you're doing, okay? I just, I just want to be really clear about this. This isn't a workspace thing. We aren't talking about what you need to do to earn your salvation. We're talking about what God does in us so that we can make him known. It's about him, his glory, not ours. The second point, we were sent out, not back. We spend a lot of times defending the faith. We really do. And if you think about it, our lives are kind of that. A lot of Christianity is defending what we believe about Scripture, defending what we believe about social issues, defending what we believe here and there, and we always feel like we're on the defense. And we're like trying to, um, Charles Spurgeon has this great picture uh, This were in one of his sermons. Uh, he was a 19th century um, uh, preacher. And, uh, and he's like, it's as if you've got this lion in a cage 
and we're all sitting there trying to protect the lion, he's like, if you just let the lion out, it'll be fine. And so here we are trying to protect the gospel, trying to protect God, to, to defend him, to, to defend who Jesus is. And he's like, just get out of the way and preach it. Just get out of the way and tell him what God is doing, what the gospel means in your life. The gospel will do the work. It's good news for a reason. If it was bad news, we would need to defend it a lot, but it's not. It's good news. It's great news. Now, I think, the problem often is that we go, well, I'm, I'm, afraid to, I'm afraid to open this can of worms because I don't feel like I'm equipped enough. I don't feel like I know enough to be able to answer all of the questions, to be able to rightly defend my position on, on different things that I think are biblical, I, and I don't really know. And when I get enough information, then... I'll start going on the offense. I'll start, I'll start proclaiming the good news. I'll, I'll be more confident. Let me just, I just want to say this really clearly. Your confidence is not in your knowledge. It's in God. It's in the gospel. It's in us saying, this is what God does. This is who he is. This is what he's done in my life. You know your own story. Are you confident of that? I mean, unless you, unless you lie about your own life a lot, right? Like, you know what your story is. You know where God has intervened in your life, and you can preach it. And it's that confidence in your eyes when you go, no, 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 this is what God did, did in my life. I'm just telling you, this is what he did. And this is what we're called to do. Over to Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It's not you. You can't do that. It's the word of God. This is why scripture is so critically important. Knowing this and, and reading and understanding who God is and how he interacts and sharing the stories with each other so that we can hear how God is intervening in lives around us. It says, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You see, when it really comes down to it, you can't argue a heart change into somebody. You just can't. It's not going to be won by a debate. God changes hearts. The Holy Spirit pierces our hearts and changes us, and makes us into a new creation. Now, what's our responsibility? To go make him known. Our confidence is in the word of God. Our confidence is not in our uh, knowledge, or ability to communicate, or anything like that. Our confidence is that I am going to speak what I know to be true, and the rest is God's work. And maybe, maybe on the spot, they'll confess Christ as their Lord, maybe. Maybe it'll be 20 years later. Maybe it'll be 40 years later when they think back and they go, I remember that one person said this one thing. Maybe that's all it is. And maybe it's, maybe God doesn't want it to be eloquent. Oftentimes, he's using exactly what that bumper video said. He uses ordinary people without any trained seminary, without any special knowledge, just us living obedient lives, being sent. That's what he's called us to. And so we're going to dissect this over the next seven weeks. We're going to go, what does it mean? Who do we go to? How do we do it? These are just two. 
two, two little pieces that I want you guys to kind of start thinking about because we're gonna apply this into our lives. How does, how does that impact my life? How does that change what I do, the decisions I make? Knowing that my responsibility is to make God known to this world. Let me pray.